with us today. Elon is a professor of mechanical engineering in the Technion. He is world renowned for his work on uh, immobilization and grasping. He is the co-author of the recent book, Mechanics of Robot Grasping. And he will tell us about configuration space pers perspective on minimalistic robot ends and caging to grasping algorithms. Elon, please. Yeah, so I start my talk with uh, this timely mask. I'm putting the mask on for the seminar. I hope everybody can see the timely mask. <laughs> Only Danny knows my sense of humor. So please, it's mandatory to put mask. I'm checking you. Micha, I see you without any mask. <laughs> No, we don't oh, sorry. sorry, guys. So you have to suffer me. So uh, the title of my uh, seminar, Configuration Space Perspectives on Minimalistic Robot Hands with uh, Caging to Grasping Algorithms. Let me start my uh, talk. So this should, uh, should I use the mouse? Okay, thank you. Okay, the talk outline is three parts. First part, I will briefly describe the notion of configuration space that we used to use for motion planning in robotics. We took it and leveraged it into robotics grasping. This is part one. Part two, generalization of robot grasp in configuration space. There's a very natural way to look at it. They are called caging grasps which allow actually realization in a robust fashion of robot grasps. Lastly, you'll see me hysterically punching my last slide. I would like to show you a coronavirus. Well, let me be more precise. It's a robot that handles biohazard sample kits using caging grasp techniques. So let me start the, the talk. Oh yeah. We just published a book. This is like a publication, you know. Please consider purchasing a book so we'll have more than 200 copies sold. So it's an advanced book in robot grasping. And I'm sure that the, you know, the market is very small. Cambridge University Press, 18 chapters. So in a way, I'm using this seminar. This is my person. I'm not, well, why, sh why shouldn't I share with you 10 years of very hard work? Okay, so for me, it's a celebration. Okay, let me move on. Part one of the talk, configuration space of multi-finger robot grasps. So the idea is, I would like to lead you to the conclusion, what should be the minimalistic robot hand design? Let me rephrase it. What should be the minimum number of robot hand fingers? that can be used to grasp arbitrary three-dimensional objects. Um, somewhere I wrote the answer. What did I write it? Okay, I have no idea what did I write it, the answer. So I would have to start by reaching this goal to describe in configuration space the notion of an equilibrium grasp. So now like a three, four techni technical slide about how one uses configuration space to represent multi-finger equilibrium grasps. Here's the notion of configuration space. B is the object, it starts with the B, freely moving in the planar environment, of course can be in 3D. We attach a reference frame to the moving object. Now we have a, a finger body that the robot hand placed in the vicinity of the moving object. Once the finger body called O is placed, the finger is stationary and it represents an obstacle. So now when we define the parameter, the configuration parameters of the object to be grasped B by its position X and Y, which I denoted here as DX, DY, and its relative orientation relative to a fixed world frame theta, which is the vertical direction, we can plot the so-called configuration space of the object, which is double quote is our moving, moving robot. 
So what you see here, this three-dimensional region is already in the configuration space whose coordinates are the position and orientation of the object in the physical environment. So it's a three-dimensional region. It is periodic in two pi. And if you select the object reference frame at different locations, you will receive the same spiraling sausage, three-dimensional. We call it configuration space obstacle. So it is topologically deformed, but it's the same shape, three-dimensional. Let me explain it. Every point inside will present position and orientation of the object where it overlaps the rigid finger body. So it's not allowed, it's impossible. However, the surface will present position and orientation where the object is touching the obstacle, in our case, the finger body from the outside. So it's okay to move in contact. A very insignificant uh, um, property we discovered about configuration space obstacle. I have looked at the configuration and uh, the coordinate mass formation associated with them, between those two parameterization. This one is for this object frame. This one is at the tip, gives us this C obstacle. I looked at the coordinate transformation, check the determinant is plus one. So when the determinant coordinate transformation is plus one, it means it is preserving volume. So actually nobody knew about it until I was having to prepare this talk. I gave it like already, this is my third time. This is why it's kind of flowing. It turns out that the volume of the C obstacle is preserved under coordinate transformation. So just because it's a new result unpublished, it probably will never be published. Do you believe it? Same volume? You believe it. I think it is a belief. Yeah, we believe it. Okay. Here now the, present the presentation of an equilibrium grasp. This example, the object is the ellipsoid, rigid body. I wrote here, object B. In this example, we have three finger bodies that represent the tips of three fingers, O1, O2, and O3. Each contact is a single point contact, and each finger body applies a force, F1, F2, and F3. Physically, when you apply a force, in order for the contact not to slide, it has to lie inside the friction cone whose size is determined by the coefficient of friction. If the point contact is frictionless, the, con the force of interaction acts along the inward contact normal to the surface of the object. So whenever you apply a force on the rigid body, in the rigid body configuration space, the force generates what we like to call a range. A range has two parts. The first part is just the physical part. Let me just point here. This is a range. It has six coordinates, six components. F1 is the physical force. Cross product X1 cross F1 is the following. Xi is the position of the contact point is described with respect to the world frame. Cross the physical force. This gives us the torque. So a range is, has two parts. The force part, Fi, and the torque part, which is the position vector Xi, cross the force Fi. So this six component vector is called a range, or if you like people who have a stronger background than me, it is called a cotangent vector. At an equilibrium grasp, the wrenches applied by the finger forces at the individual contact have to sum up, this is zero if it's not clear, have to sum up to net zero force and net zero torque, okay? So this is the definition of an equilibrium graph. The sum of the wrenches have to be equal to zero. Now, please note that the, this, in fact, tells you that the wrenches seen as vectors in the six-dimensional cotangent space have to be linearly dependent, okay? The physical force magnitude actually comes out as a coefficient. These are just six vectors that have to be linearly dependent with non-negative coefficient, which represents the physical force magnitudes. Now, fundamental fact actually already stated by many people in the motion planning literature. If you look at the configuration space obstacle, this spiraling sausage, when a finger touches the object, it is a point on the surface, keep open there. It is a point on the surface of the C obstacle. Let me repeat it. 
when the finger body is touching an object and the object is freely moving, but the finger is stationary, we are now positioned at the point on the surface of the sea obstacle. When the finger applies the force and the force is frictionless, namely acting along the contact normal to the physical object, in sea space, the range is collinear with the sea obstacle surface normal. It is a very important fact. I'm, sure I'm going to show it, but let me just read it for you. At a frictionless contact, the ice finger range is collinear with the ice sea obstacle surface normal. Let me illustrate it for several equilibrium graphs. Now, the next two slides show examples of equilibrium grasps where the contact is frictionless. Here is, this is a two finger grasp. This is a two finger grasp. It's an equilibrium grasp because the contact forces are collinear and have opposite direction. Same as here. Here you see the configuration space obstacle correspond to both grasp. They are equilibrium grasp where you can see it in configuration space, draw the tangent plane to the two C obstacle. The point Q1 is the configuration point of the object. You see the two tangent plane are coincident. So the C obstacle normals are collinear. Similarly here, the two tangent plane are coincident. The C obstacle normals are collinear, okay? Here's the next example, three finger equilibrium grasp. The fact that the C obstacle have different curvature, I'm going to go really deep in this talk into it, ignore it now. This is a three finger equilibrium grasp under frictionless contact. This is another example of a three finger equilibrium grasp under frictionless contact. The, contact, the, the graphical condition is that the contact normal lines have to intersect at a common point. This happens here and also happens here. This ensures that there exists finger force magnitude such that the net torque acting on the object is zero. And the force direction has to positively span the origin of the um, force coordinates. In C space, look at the C space obstacle. CO1 is induced by this obstacle, fixed finger body. CO2 by this finger. CO3 by this finger. At the contact position, three fingers, we have to, to close the windows, or unfortunately. So you are going to laugh. What is happening? There's a noise because of rockets. No, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say rockets. People, people will escape from my talk. We have an aeronautics department nearby, and they have like they are developing all kinds of you know special uh, engines for aircraft. So they are just doing experiments with lots of noise. So just closing all the windows. Sorry. So the three fingers are touching the objects. So the configuration of the objects Q zero is on the boundary on the intersection of the three C obstacle surfaces at both equilibrium grasp. Look at the tangent plane. Do you see that they share a line in common? This line in common actually shows you that the three C obstacle normals, they are collinear, sorry, they're linearly dependent. So the lie on the common plane, which is in this case just a horizontal plane. Just to give you intuition, there are also tangent vectors that lie here. This direction, which is parallel to the theta axis, represents pure rotation of the object about this point. Similarly here, please note that along this pure rotation, actually I can escape into the free space, the free configuration space. I'm separating from all three obstacles, C obstacles simultaneously. Physically, when you do this instantaneous rotation, I break contact with the three fingers, just to give you some intuition. Down, representing equilibrium grasp. Next notion. In order to, to answer the question, what is the minimum number of fingers required for the design of robot hands? First of all, I, I'm forget to, I'm afraid to forget my uh, like very bad jokes. So here I buried a very bad joke. Spoiler, the answer must be five fingers in the palm. Yeah, the human hand is so marvelous. It has to be five fingers in the palm. Gone, we can go, right? Solve the problem. So let's see what is the real answer. So the, the notion to decide how many fingers are needed is called object immobilization. 
definition. It's a placement of the finger bodies about the rigid object, such that the object is fully immobilized. This is the most secure notion of grasp, and it is called in the classical literature form closure grasps. It is based on first order geometric effects of the configuration space obstacles. Uh, what else I would like to say? I'm sorry, I know I wanted to say something else about it. Uh, immobilization, yes. In configuration space, uh, when uh, several fingers holding an object, let's say in the object configuration is Q0, immobilization means that the C obstacle, the configuration space obstacle, completely surround this point. I repeat, object is immobilized if and only if, goes both ways. The C obstacles completely surround the configuration point of the object where it is being held by the fingers. I'm going to exemplify it. So why we are talking about the immobilization? Because the question of the minimum number of fingers is reduced to the question of what is the minimum of number of fingers that can be used to immobilize arbitrary 3D objects subject to the fact that we do not want to rely on friction if the contacts only rigid body effects using motion planning techniques because friction is highly unreliable. Even if you measured it, by the end of the day, humidity changed, surface smoothness changed, so the coefficient of friction changed. Okay, you can say with today's tool, let me relearn it very quickly. I'm shutting up, it's a good option. But let's assume the most conservative approach, frictionless contact. Let me point out, in order to immobilize an object, we surround the configuration point completely by, by the configuration space obstacles, we have to hold the object at an equilibrium grasp. Most people have stronger mass background than myself. Therefore, I, have to, I felt obliged to add this sentence this morning when I prepared the talk, which is explaining why. If you don't happen to hold the object at the at an equilibrium grasp, you take the intersection of the half spaces bounded by the C obstacle tangent planes at the object configuration point. The intersection of a finite number of such half planes, sorry, half spaces, will give you a convex cone. This convex cone represents a non-empty interior, represents motion where can, we can break contact simultaneously with all fingers, move away. Unless the object is held at an equilibrium grasp, so all my tangent plane are kind of collinear, and the three, those half spaces, when they intersect them, they do not give me a convex cone. They basically give me a degenerate convex cone, like a lower dimensional subspace with empty interior. I just try to give you geometric intuition why frictionless equilibrium grasp is necessary condition for immobilizing objects. Let me move on. This is just an, an example. The object head is, is not, is held by four fingers, but graphically you can check. This is not, I repeat, this is not a feasible equilibrium grasp under frictionless contact. Indeed, the object is motion to which is, is able to escape the fingers. It's not immobilized because equilibrium is necessary for immobilization. Let me move on. Example, the first example of the notion of immobilization. Uh, maybe my lecture becomes more and more technically thick. It will become much thicker later, so I apologize. Here are two three-finger equilibrium graphs. We already know that instantaneous rotations here, even local rotations, we break contact and the object can move between the fingers. You can see it here. The configuration point Q0, it's an equilibrium graph but there is like a three-dimensional cone of escape motions. However, in this example, three-finger equilibrium grasp because of, and now I'm going to say a new notion, because of second order curvature effects at the contact, the C obstacle are kind of curving inward along the theta direction. As a result, the object configuration point Q0 is completely isolated by the C obstacle, the object is indeed fully immobilized by the fingers at this equilibrium grasp. It is highly secure equilibrium grasp. Another question, what's the minimum number of finger bodies 
require to immobilize any 2D object and later any 3D object. Remember, human hand has five fingers and the palm. So the answer is buried there. Uh, let me move on. So I try to answer this question now. I wanted to say something here and remember later. Okay. If I rely only on first order geometric effects, which are just in configuration space, the tangent planes to the C obstacles, the general result goes as follows. Every 2D object, including those with parallel edges, can be immobilized by four fingers using first order geometric effects. Let me rephrase it. Any four finger equilibrium grasp automatically immobilizes the object unless it's a degenerate equilibrium grasp. For instance, four fingers that lie on, on two and two on parallel edges. I'll show you an example of the secret cases. But four fingers can immobilize any to the object using first order effects. In 3D, we need at least seven fingers. The geometric reason is as follows. I should have added the reason here for you guys because when you use only those half spaces, you need the dimension of config. Oh, do me a favor, mask. We need the dimension of configuration space plus one. So for 3D object, configuration space is six dimensional, three positions and three orientation. So obviously, if you if you have at your disposal only half spaces, you have to cut them, cut them into section to get a single point. You need the dimension of the C space plus one. So it's four in 2D, seven in 3D. Highly redundant, highly, high, this is not, not the minimalistic result. Let me now show you what happens in, with curvature effects. With curvature effects, here's the trick. If you want to immobilize the object using curvature effects, you take the object, for example, this polygon, and you expand the disk. The maximally inscribed disk generically touches, so it's probably moving, you just maximize its area. Generically, it hits the boundary of the object from the inside at three points. They are automatically coincident in the disk center and they generate a feasible equilibrium graph, which for a polygon, because of the flat curvature of the edges, is automatically immobilizing. So this is an immobilizing three-finger grasp, immobilizing three-finger grasp, and of course, it might happen that the object has parallel edges, even with that, we can handle it. But the take-home is, for 2D object, when you include curvature effects, you can immobilize any 2D object, not with four fingers, based on first order effects alone, but it's enough to use only three fingers. When you have to apply both combination of first order and the curvature of the C obstacles. Look, I think I'm going to skip over it. Just please, you know, make it like a, a photo show, you know, uh, for, take a shot. We can handle also objects with parallel edges and with concave corners. Still, we need only three fingers. There's a caveat. When we have flat, no, flat parallel edges, one finger has to be sufficiently flat with respect to its curvature. But take home, we need three fingers. I want to move to 3D. Here, I have to very carefully ask you, now this is homework, online homework. What is your hunch? What is the minimum number of finger bodies required to immobilize any 3D object, let's say generic, without parallel facets, let's say any generic polyhedral object, what is the minimum number of finger bodies? Is it like five because the human hand is five fingers? Is it three like required in 2D? Should I walk you along or you, you want me to shut up? I'm going to shut up for five seconds at my cup of tea. What's the minimum number, number to immobilize 3D object based on the combination of first order and second order or curvature effects? Remember, first order effects only, you need seven fingers. What's the minimum when you get curvature into the game? Look here. Uh, I, I have a very interactive participation. Nobody wants to jump into the water, suggest the minimum number of fingers. Um, 
I see huge, huge attendance, by the way. I, are you being shy or something? They are not shy. Let me walk you, look. First order effects, seven fingers, we understand it. So the possible numbers are either three, four, five, or six. Three for economical reason, this is the minimum number for 2D objects. Come on, it can be in 3D. So the options are four, five, or six. Should I provide the answer? The answer is four finger bodies. I never had an intuitive proof why this is correct. Until this morning, I think eventually I realized it for, goes like this. I hope you'll follow me. I'll talk very fast now. If you consider the fixed orientation slices of the six dimensional configuration space. You know, we don't see your hands. We don't see your hands. If you're doing some. You're uh, no, I'm not really not using my hands <laughs> at all. But uh, look, here is the argument why four is the minimum. Uh, look at this, the configuration space obstacles. The curvature of each fixed orientation, each each fixed orientation slice where the body moves with fixed orientation in space, it's a three-dimensional body. So it's a three-dimensional region in R6, okay? The boundary of this uh, three-dimensional region is just a surface. This surface is convex. If the object to be grasped is convex at the contact and the finger body is convex at the contact. So the C-obstacle surface at each fixed orientation slice is convex. So now you have just this like convex C obstacle. So curvature doesn't give me any advantage. So now just think about how you mobilize the translation and degrees of freedom. The C obstacle slices, they're just convex forbidden regions. So you need the, the dimension of your ambient space, three, just translation plus one, to completely isolate the position of degrees of freedom of the 3D object. So ignoring you know, the, the orientational parts, I'll take care of this later. Just translational, I need at least four. Look, this is not a mature argument like was cooked eventually after many years, only this morning, but I think it's a, the correct argument. So let me now move on. Just sorry, sorry, take a picture guys. We can handle also, oh, the technique to generate this you, you, you blow up a ball, maximally inscribed ball inside the polyhedron. Generically, it will touch the surface either two points, three points, four points. Four points is a concentric immobilizing grasp, second order immobilizing. Three points, the three facets have to be coaxial. We can solve it here, four finger immobilization. If the, the maximally inscribed ball touches at only two points, it means the object is two opposing parallel facets, like this cube here. So we can drag this maximally ball to the corner. Again, get second over immobilization using four finger bodies. So four fingers is the minimum number. There is a caveat. If the object is spatial and coaxial facets, or just parallel opposing facets, well, at least one finger has to be sufficiently flat at the contact. Otherwise, four fingers, sufficient. So here's the answer. Minimalistic robot hands, here's the answer. Minimalistic robot hands in 3D, they have two options. Either we design a robot hand using four fingers, that's the minimum number required to immobilize any 3D object, or alternatively, this is a nice trick, we can design a three finger hand and use the palm of the robot hand as the fourth contact. So let me show you, and there's an anticlimax. It turns out such a hand was already designed 30 years ago. So this is crazy. We arrived to this conclusion methodically using configuration space tools, only to discover after really like 15, 20 years of work that one of the first hand designed in the robotic cell research community is called the Salisbury hand. 1982 is exactly the minimalistic hand. But here's an illustration. This is the minimalistic hand. Three fingers plus the palm can fully immobilize this ellipsoidal shape object and any other 3D object. So using curvature effects reduces the number of finger contacts I need to use 
from seven to three plus a pawn or just four. Okay, now if I use sufficiently flat curvatures at the contact, of course, I gain higher advantage of immobilization. I'm not sure how to quantify it. I can only quantify the point is isolated or not. But intuitively, now if you use here flatter curvature, something good is happening. The overlap of the volume between the sea obstacles increases. Not sure how to move it forward. Here's the illustration of the Salisbury hand. As you can see, most of the time, Salisbury hand uses only three fingers because it exploits friction at the contact. Here, the object is not immobilized, is not. If the friction is very low, this uh, nut will just escape in this direction. Similarly, the apple can uh, freely rotate and then escape if the, if the friction is very low. Please look, this is silicon with very high coefficient of friction. So we can exploit friction to do fine manipulation using three fingers. When the emergency arrived or we need a high con conservative grasp, like flying platform, we take the three fingers and we press the object against the palm, like illustrated here. So this is really a universal minimalistic robot. And we got our answer. Done chapter one of my talk. Let me see. I think I'm done with this chapter. Oh, oh yeah, I must illustrate it. I think this is important. I promised to talk about the, oh, there's a, another question. I think I'm going to skip because I want to have time to other topics. There was a, a associate question. If the minimum number of uh, fingers is four or three plus a pound, what's the minimum number of actuators a hand can have? The answer is in fact, a single actuator is enough. Why? Because the robot hand is held by a robot arm. So we devised several techniques and I, I can send you the, the movie we just took like last week. We can use the environment to change the shape to restructure the hand according to the grasp and the object to be grasped. Once we restructure the hand, we lock everything and then a single actuator can close the hand to the, to the desired grasp using the notion of called caging grasps. Okay, so a single actuator is enough. Uh, I just wanted to say something about this uh, to why the human hand is five fingers in the palm, while our math and analysis gives us that minimalistic robot hands need only three fingers in the palm. Look, I want to, to I hope people, uh, oh, do you think people can see my, uh, I'm going to demonstrate that actually the human hand, strangely enough, it seems highly redundant. It has, it has five fingers. Okay. The human hand has five fingers and the palm. So a total of six contacts, but we need only four. So here's what I didn't know about it. So first of all, why we have five? Actually, researchers think they know about it. It's back in the Devonian period, which is something like 350 million years ago, uh, our ancestors were actually swimming in the sea and the dynamics of swimming, you get an advantage if you have five appendages. So actually all, how do you say young Kim? All, uh, mammals. all mammals. All mammals, I think have uh, five digits including horses, elephants, giraffes, just some of them like, but you can, you can find the trace. I think many fish maybe have, but anyway, so this is the reason why we have five digits, but not for you for grasping objects. We don't need, we need perhaps we, need, we required it during the Devonian period for swimming, but that was many, many years ago. So what is happening now, uh, what is happening? We are stuck with five, finger, with five fingers because of the swimming purposes. Evolution is very, very pro in adjusting the design. It's not built to get rid of full you know, systems. So what do you, what you see is, a, I'm looking for the word, uh, Litnoven. What's the word in, in English? Yes, yeah, Degenerate. so what you have, you have like slow degeneration of, we have here five fingers. Actually, we have two pairs. These two fingers are actually acting as a single finger. Sorry, okay, it's a really acting with a single finger. These two fingers acting, I'm not sure here it is. 
these two fingers are acting as a single finger. You can check it, press very hard against these two fingers. And what you're going to feel is the sinews, the dim sinews acting back to the elbow region. If you press very hard on these pair of fingers, you can feel the sinews acting very hard against attachment here. So those two pairs are actually actuated by two different system of sinews. And really we have a three finger hand, which got stuck in the depth of evolution. It's really a three finger hand plus a palm. So usually what I'm going to do, I'm going here is I brought another cup. Look how easy it is for me to manipulate, sorry, to manipulate an object using only three fingers. The only three contacts is because I'm relying on friction like the Salisbury hand. From time to time, there is an emergency. So I have to grab my entire hand, palm with three fingers, full immobilization, full security. By the way, when you hold something with a, at an equilibrium glass with friction, it's called force closure grasp. We changed the notation in our book, no more force closure, it's a poor name. So it's a time for you guys get adjusted. We change uh, form closure, we change it to object immobilization. A suggestion of uh, Frank uh, van der Stappen from Holland. We change force closure, like putting the us with friction forces, we change it to wrench resistant grasp because you can locally resist with the frictional forces, not only external forces, but also external torques that are trying to perturb the object. Now let me move to the next chapter of the talk, the notion of caging grasps. Hey, I was boasting the three fingers are enough. I'm cheating, guys. I'm not able even to, to press the arrow button on my keyboard using those things, I better, better become human again. Okay, that's the, I need about 10, 15 minutes. Let me budget my time. Now it's 10 to five, I have 20 minutes. I'll count five minutes before the end. Uh, hold it, hold it. Danny told me that uh, I have one hour. Say it again? Do you have any questions? So, one, so maybe I should cut after 15 minutes, uh, five, zero minutes. Oh, I see, so I, so I have to cut it uh, five. It's That's five okay. Uh, alone, you can go till uh, five past five. That's okay. Okay, okay, perfect. So I take it the uh, 12 minutes on caging grass. Let me describe the notion. Next slide is just definition. Here's the definition. What is a caging grass? In a cage, here's an object, B. This like butterfly shaped rigid object. When you think about two finger hand in the planar environment, an object is caged when I place two fingers around the object, keep the fingers stationary. So here they are, O1 and O2. The object is caged if it has a, a freedom to move between the surrounding fingers, but it cannot escape to infinity. I'll show you in a second how this property looks in configure, looks like in configuration space, but let me repeat the definition. An object is caged when the finger bodies form a cage that allows the object bounded mobility. Okay, so here's the, now here's the very important thing. Once the object is caged by the finger bodies, we developed a theory by which we can close the cage using a single closing parameter. In this case of two fingers, it's just the distance on between, on between the two fingers. And we can guarantee that as we close the two fingers, uh, so we are given a target immobilizing grasp. You see those two fingers here? They immobilize the objects. We have computational tools that we can compute such immobilizing grasp. When you spread the fingers locally about in a target immobilizing, immobilizing grasp, Automatically, the fingers form a cage. Now we reverse order. We can identify caging regions that surround a target immobilizing grass. In this case, I just know it's going to be, the escape will be in equilibrium here. One region is roughly here, one is here. When you place the two fingers in the caging region, 
There is a theory that says if you contract the cage, just close the distance between the two fingers, automatically the cage, the bounded mobility is going to monotonically reduce until the two fingers reach the immobilizing grasp, even if, this is important for engineering, even if one finger happens to hit the object on the way, doesn't matter. The object can move as, as, as a result of small position errors in the control of the finger positions or small modeling or geometric modeling of the object, doesn't matter. The two fingers, as they close, they force the object to realign and they reach the mobilizing grasp. So this transition is extremely important in the realization of immobilizing grass has become a foundation of robot grass mechanics. Okay, here's the configuration space. You remember that in immobilizing grass, the object configuration Q0 is completely surrounded by the configuration space obstacles induced by the stationary fingers. One, one, when we start to spread the fingers apart, I'm going to say here an important sentence, okay? Try to focus. When, when we spread the fingers apart, in configuration space, the C obstacles, they move apart. The isolated configuration Q0 becomes a closed cavity. As long as this closed cavity is a closed cavity, the object, which is just a configuration point, is a bounded mobility. So a cage is a closed cavity surrounded by the C obstacles. And it's if and only if. Now, if you want to compute the largest possible caging regions surrounding a given target immobilizing grasp, you keep spreading those C obstacles apart until a critical event occurs. I illustrate the critical event here. Here, the fingers are very close, so they create a wall, okay? They, they cannot move through. At a certain critical event, by the way, it has to be in equilibrium grasp, frictionless, there appears first time a puncture on the boundary of the closed cavity in configuration space. It happens here, locally. After the puncture, I have a small tunnel where I can escape to the remaining unbounded free space. So when we compute this critical puncture point grass, we use it to compute the maximally large caging regions surrounding a given target immobilizing grass. I'm budgeting my time Uh, should I show you a movie or talk about the geometric algorithm? Uh, or there's any some error message? No, just close. Perfect. I skipped the movie. Uh, just Elana, let me. I want to ask a question, but yes, uh, please. I don't want to take out to take up too much of your time. No, it's okay. Uh, please go to the previous slide. I need to skip off the movie somehow later. So oh, how can I go to the previous? Oh, I can press. Because I'm stuck in the movie somehow. We are trying. Can I stuck on this Never silly mind. movie? Never mind. Uh, hello, please continue. If time remains, I'll, I'll okay. ask at the end. Uh, are you sure, Danny? Yeah, yeah, I'll ask at the end. Okay, I would like to encourage question. I, I'll be frank with you. Your question, I helpful. Okay, I'm serious. Your questions are helpful. I don't care, the questions do, do not bother me, on the contrary, it's no. When you ask, you engage. Okay, so let me move on. In order to do fast computation of those caging regions, we use a very special sub. The hand is now four-dimensional configuration space. When you compute the caging region that surround the target grasp, we take a reference frame attached to the robot hand. It has three degrees of freedom position and orientation, plus an extra degree of freedom, which is the interfinger distance. So the configuration space of the full two-finger robot hand is four-dimensional. Dx, dy, theta, and let's call it interfinger distance sigma. It turns out that in this uh, high-dimensional configuration space, it's enough to analyze the two-finger contact positions in a space called contact space, which is just two dimensional. So we prioritize the object boundary and we plot here a two dimensional space whose coordinates are S1 and S2, being the position of two fingers parameterized in counterclockwise order along the object boundary. Now magic, 
if you plot the contours of the interfinger distance, I call it sigma in this case, the immobilizing grasp, you see these green dots, this is an immobilizing two finger grasp. Immobilizing two finger grasp, they appear as local minima of the interfinger distance. The um, puncture grasp that connects the closed cavity between two neighboring configuration space cavities happens to be here. These are critical events, they have to be equilibrium grasp. Okay, they have to be. It's a sadder point. Finally, there is another escape, uh, there's another like puncture grasp here, appears here. This is the maximal size of the interfinger distance beyond which I can take my two fingers, think about the object is stationary, I move it like this and I escape to infinity. Equivalently, this is the maximal opening of the fingers where the object can escape to infinity. It's again an equilibrium grasp, and it is this set of points. An escape is along the main diagonal where the two fingers touch along the obstacle boundary. In this case, I can take my two finger hand, move to infinity. So we build a graph O. This contact space is partitioned into rectangles. Each rectangle describes finger contact on two specific edges. So we build a discrete geometric data structure. Okay, here's my bad joke again. We do computational geometry now. Okay, sorry, I, because I know you have two orders of magnitude more than me on this uh, area, but it's called the caging graph. In each rectangle of contact space, we have all of one node, the corners and the equilibrium grasp. We connect nodes, so we have total of O n square, n being the total number of edges of the polygonal object. We have n square uh, nodes. We have n square, no n to the cube, n square, because this O1 nodes in each rectangle. We have n square edges. We do graph search only incremental. We don't build everything. We do incremental search starting from the target immobilizing grasp outward until we find the puncture grasp escape to infinity. Getting the maximal interfinger distance, we are able to plot in physical space the two caging regions surrounding the immobilizing grasp. Let me explain. We were given as input this target immobilizing grass. Using the what you like to call a caging graph, and it takes, I wrote it here. The computation for this object took like half a second, okay? Uh, the incremental, it's like water fluting. So this is immobilizing graphs. There is another one hiding here. This is one finger here, one finger here, it's immobilizing graphs. There is a saddle point or a puncture point connecting those two neighboring cavities in configuration space is this one. We refine this neighboring local minimum using this technique here, graph search, and eventually we find the escape puncture graph. In this case, by the way, it's right here. From here, I can escape to infinity. I promise to keep to myself the last five minutes to talk about the corona robot. So, so look, I have a chapter about extending it to more complicated finger systems. We are stuck with extending the caging graph technique to 3D. We are really stuck. The problem is terribly complicated. We want to solve it in a computational geometric uh, manner. Build a discrete search graph. For 3D objects, think how much this problem is daunting. We know that we, we will need four fingers, okay, to do this uh, caging. Two is not enough. Each finger moves on the facet of the polyhedral object has two parameters. Contact space will have to be analyzed with every pair of fingers out of the four. Each pair of fingers needs four parameters to describe its contact space, which is the lowest space you can, you can get away with. So we have like how many pairs out of four? I don't know, maybe six. I, I might know, you're better than me. So we have a couple of them, right? Uh, yeah, I think we have six. Six uh, two finger contact spaces. Each of one of them is four-dimensional. We have to glue them together along multi-finger contact. Then we have to embed the, the caging graph and do our search. This is an open problem. I'm looking for partners. Let me repeat it. Anybody wants to work with me on it, let's go for it. But it's a really challenging problem, extremely important. Corona, robot and are finish. Look, this is from an Israeli hospital picture. This is what's happening. We're all trying to contribute something, you know, to what's happening outside of the university. 
you see this uh, orange bucket, it's actually important. So let me introduce our, our lady here that is doing the, it's the technician. This region here, you cannot see it very well, but it's isolated. There is a glass window, glass wall here. The lady, the technician is isolated from this area, which is very dangerous. From the field station inspection, this bucket is full with about 550 kit, sample kits. Each sample kit is wrapped in one or two nylon bags. Inside there is a rigid canister. She has to, the technician has to unscrew the canister. Take out, I have a movie, but no time for it. Take out the test tube. Uh, no, no, disinfect it, read the code bar, because it comes with the form, place it on this inspection rig that goes into the PCR machine. So we designed the following robot. I, I'll just explain it while we see the movie because I want to finish right on time. We use caging glass techniques. The robot lower gripper using cage closes on the wrapped sample. Now there's an upper gripper coming from the top and there's going to be a rotating blade cutting the plastic bag. You see it now. Okay, now we're cutting the plastic bag. And remember, I have a caging grasp right here. After cutting the plastic bag, I have another gripper hiding here, catching the upper part of the test tube. Now I'm lifting the test tube out of the lower cage. I have bounded mobility, so I open my fingers, you see? We, we take it out in upward position. Now we can read the barcode safely. And then now we designed motion into the storage rack fully ready. So I just want to finish on time. I think this is a good time to say thank you. Of course, remind you, you can uh, remove masks. So it's my last joke. I know they're not good high quality jokes. Any questions, please? Thank you very much, Elon. Sure, sure, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. I want to understand because um, if you remember, the, can you bring up the slide before the gun? I can attempt, a brave attempt. Danny, this is not a gun. <laughs> no, it's, it's important because now we have international uh, collaborators. This <laughs> one, <laughs> okay. This one for the jigsaw. Uh, I just this want one. to make sure that I understand that uh, at the bottom of the picture you cannot have a caging grasp, right? Of course not. Here's what I do. In this picture, I illustrate only two C obstacles how they interact with each other. The puncture glass, when they separate, will be a puncture front between C obstacles, or this is less intuitive and less and less say common between three. It's possible when you separate apart the first, first puncture front, usually only two C obstacles will be involved, like I'm showing here. But there's here a third one which I did not show. Sometimes the puncture will be a three-finger puncture, the all touch and the, and the puncture point is exactly on the intersection of three. See obstacle surfaces. Please, Daniel, I'm not sure because I know you have a follow up question. Okay. I, what I'm, I want to ask you something. Uh, what you're actually looking for are voids in C space, what you call bounded cavities. Yes. I call it voids. But uh, I thought you might be looking for something more than this that whenever you start from specified positions, no matter how you squeeze, you'll always slide into your critical grasping point. It's a good what point. I wonder is, are you interested in local minima or to bypass those local minima that might be grasps, but not your target grasp? Of course. So here's the answer. It is possible when you start to spread the fingers apart, my cavity will go larger. You call it void, which is interesting. I will get the first puncture point with join, that joins a neighboring cavity. So now I have a composite cavity that if I now shrink back my fingers, let's say the interfinger distance in the case of two fingers, I can reach either of those two local minima. I'm not guaranteed anymore to reach my target immobilizing wasp. 
However, I know I will reach one of discrete options, but with my vision system, I already very quickly could compute those neighboring immobilizing graphs. So when I'm done reading the finger or the, the joint sensors, I know where my system arrived precisely, even if I did everything open up with huge errors. If you insist on reaching only the target graphs, you must spread the fingers until the first puncture point. We call it the first uh, caging region. Then there are intermediate caging region. And finally, there's the largest escape to infinity caging region. So you stop at the first puncture point. Of course, we can compute it. We do compute it. It will give you a smaller caging region to place the fingers. If you're willing to finish it, maybe some neighboring immobilizing graph, you get larger caging regions. So it is give and take. Uh, okay, I, I still thought that even if you're inside one cavity, you might reach two different grasping. Not possible. Donna, Not because possible? The, okay. No, because the cavity is associated with a single local menu. You have to stack those shrinking cavity in four dimensional space. So really, if you stack them together, you reach a local minimum along the interfinger distance axis with the fourth axis. So basically, we rely on stratified Morse theory to actually put our fingers on all those critical events and show that topologically, you cannot get anything new. So a puncture point is a saddle point of this sigma. And the immobilized box is a local minimum in this full configuration space. So using those tools, which, those tools, which I preferred not to mention, yeah, yeah, you're guaranteed to reach the unique target equilibrium graph. And this is why it is called, is that today the standard practice, how you actually realize a grasp. Please note, once you have a tunnel and you can escape to infinity, you need to somehow realize this thing. Then it, before the object is caged, there is a pre-cage region that lead to the caging regions, open problem. Nobody knows how to compute them. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Elon. A any other questions? Don't hesitate, you can unmute yourself. More questions? So can I use it to ask you all a question of mine that I prepared? Go ahead. I, I have a question in geometry. Somebody from all of you geniuses should have the answer. I asked Danny about it about three days ago. We, in our to do like what we call inverse kinematics of robot arms, uh, we have the two rotational joints, robot arm, just two joints, theta one, theta two, and they're rotational. The end point draws for us a two dimensional torus in three dimensional space. We have now another robot arm with its own two revolu joints that draws its own toes. So I give you two two-dimensional toe, but they are geometric toe. They are not deformed, not anything. They're nice, perfect central axis is a nice circle, okay? Generated by two rotational joints, robot arm. You have two such two-dimensional toe. Now we want to intersect them in order to get a solution for the inverse kinematics problem. Yes, can you close the door? Thank you. Here's the question. Is it true that two such tori intersect at most at four one-dimensional curves? Even think about the cylinder, two-dimensional cylinder intersecting such a geometric torus. Is it true that a cylinder intersects a torus at most at four isolated, each one is connected curves and not more than that? Now we're kind of banging our head. I'm sure this is a known result in the literature. Cannot find it. It's really frustrating. So, no. Try to help us. Any more questions, Danny? Uh, okay. So if you have a question, you can write to Elon. If you want Please. Elon's email address, you can find it in messages or write to me, and I'll connect with you and you and Elon. So thank I you. want to thank Elon again, and want to make two short announcements uh, not related to Elon's talk. Uh, the first one relates to uh, some message I sent uh, in, a, in the computational geometry mailing list about the sausage test of time award. I encourage you 
to submit your nominations. It's very easy. You can, you can use this ultra simple form or send an email to the address that appears in the message. I encourage you all to submit nominations. And uh, the second message is about, uh, I hope you see it, yes, is about next week when we'll have Omrit Filzer from Sunny Stony Brook who will talk about static and streaming data structures for fresh air distance queries. That's all for today. Stay safe. See you next week. Bye-bye.